evening, good evening, good evening, good evening. The song in the background is that he's never lost. He's never lost a battle, and that will play a key theme in tonight's discussion as we talk about Passover, and we continue to talk about the sovereignty of the Lord, and deliverance comes from the Lord himself, and nothing and no one else. And so, let's we'll just take a few moments to allow the song to flow just a little bit as we prepare and posture our hearts for prayer tonight. As we believe and reach out and acknowledge that he's never lost a battle. And the refrain says, you can do all things but fail. And it's a powerful statement if that's your confession tonight, I guess, that I would just ask you to glorify his name tonight. If you truly believe that he is sovereign over all things in your life, seen and unseen, as we get ready to go and divide his word and break it down and show how deliverance is in his hands for those who are willing to believe. And so he's never lost a battle, not over the physical, not over the spiritual, the mental, emotional. And so we're going to compare and contrast the plight of his firstborn, Israel, and the modern day church tonight. If you'll go with me tonight as we go into prayer and we just reach out to the heavenly realms for his touch tonight and we thank him for his presence into our lives tonight wherever you are respectively embrace hope and wherever you are who might be listening uh, to this or any other thing we just glorify the Lord tonight for you could be anywhere in this world but you have chosen to come here and to listen to what thus says the Lord and as we believe on him tonight just know that deliverance is in his hand. The same God that sent his only begotten son to save you from an eternal death, an eternal plight, will see you through the temporal stages of your life. So receive that tonight as we go into prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your love. And we thank you for your steadfast and loyal devotion to us, Father God. Wicked and deceitful and, and dirty creatures. But Father God, your love has drawn us near to you, Father God. And we know this because you got us up today, Father God. You kept us not only in our right mind, but Father God, even though we have woes and we have anxieties and we have fears and problems, Father God, you have kept us and you have delivered us for death was knocking at our door. But Father God, you allowed us to be safe in your arms today, Father God. And although we didn't get it right, Father God, we know and we rest assured in your strength, Father God, in the midst of our weakness tonight, Father God. So we're praying for those who don't know you tonight, Father God. We're opening up the doors to this sanctuary, to this church that is us, Father God, our temple, Father God, for the people, Father God, are having a meeting engagement with you, Father God, your spirit, your son, Father God, and your word. So as that exchange goes forth and the encounter goes forth, Father God, we are Thanking you now, Father God, for the shift, the shift, the shift, Father God, for those that don't know you, Father God, that a seed might be planted in the Word, that something might be heard, Father God, that will cause them to change, to change their mindset about who you are, Father God, that light will go into darkness tonight, Father God, so we're speaking to the soul, Father God, to the unsaved soul tonight, we're speaking next to the soul that has trusted in you for salvation, trusted in your Lord, Jesus Christ, your Son, Father God, who bore his sins upon the cross, bore our sins upon the cross, and having not known any sin, Father God, willingly took those sins, and Father God went to the grave and rose again on the third day, Father God, and now is seated at the right hand side, Father God, and will come again. So we thank you now for this testimony, Father God, and we proclaim it that a word that might be heard tonight, Father God, would not only plant a seed of righteousness into those who have declared and decreed that you, Father God our righteousness and yes, coming through Jesus Christ Father God there is no other way so we exclaim the name of Jesus tonight Father God that we might rightly divide this word but we ask for your spirit to anoint our heads Father God and anoint our hearts Father God and anoint our lips Father God so that every word that goes through our mind Father God that permeates through our heart Father God that we speak and walk in it Father God that the ones that we initially pray for that don't know you Father God that those souls might see the light of your word in us Father God and so now, Father God, we finally come and speak to our frailties, Father God, and our, our, our infirmities, Father God, right now in the name of Jesus, for we know that all things are in your hands. And Father God, so we wait with giddy anticipation as what you have already decreed, Father God, is made manifest in your time. So we thank you now for the seed of your word, Father God, the love of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the move of your spirit, Father God. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. We thank you, we thank you, we thank you, we thank you, Lord. 
So as we come before you tonight, we're just going to we're gonna gonna continue to expand upon that. We're in the book of Exodus, and primarily tonight we'll come from Exodus 12 verses 1 through 13, as the Lord says the same. But I've got a bunch of other supporting scripture tonight, and we got a lot of stuff. And those who are on um, on Google Meet, we're on Facebook Live, and we're also on Google Meet. Uh, so those who are on Google Meet, hopefully uh, you're able to see um, Bible Gateway and it has Exodus 12 uh, beaming up on the New King James Version and a New English uh, translation there. And as I mentioned, as I mentioned, we're going to go and we're going to divide this word tonight and we're going to talk about the Passover, right? And the, the Passover is a very esteemed Jewish holiday, but as you will learn, as you probably already know, Obviously, our Lord Jesus Christ coming from the, 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 the Jews um, and his disciples coming from uh, the Jews, from uh, the, the remnant to Israel there, celebrating Passover on the night that he was betrayed. So there's a lot of, a lot of connection there from the Old Testament to the New Testament and to the modern day church. I want to break this thing down and hopefully you receive something tonight that will cause you to have some independent and directed study uh, through the Holy Spirit. And go back and chew on that and to be able to ask questions. If you're on uh, Google Meet, feel free to, to ask some questions. If you're on Facebook Live, I challenge you to put, um, put some questions uh, into the dialogue there. And if I don't see it, then, then somebody will, will probably bop me upside the head lovingly um, and, and let me know that there is a question there. And if we don't have answers, then, uh, then, then we'll, we'll use the Lord to go and get some direct study there. So we challenge one another. Um, because every day is a new day and a new revelation with this word that has stood the test of time. While the word hasn't changed, our, our guidance and our direction in it um, and our knowledge and understanding of it um, becomes greater as we walk more with him and walk away from the world. So um, I'm excited tonight, as I am every night, but I just want to recap real quickly the last week as we went through and we were studying the, the ten plagues uh, these last couple of weeks, the ten plagues that are shown in Exodus, and really shown from Exodus 7 um, through 12, right? And there, there are ten plagues there. Everything from the first one was turning the, the water uh, to blood, right? Um, we, we saw some frogs, um, an excessive amount of frogs. I happen to like frogs, but I, I guess it gets to the point where you see a whole bunch of frogs, and it just becomes overwhelming. Uh, there were boils, um, the, the, the cattle um, were, 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 were diseased, um, you had locusts, swarming locusts uh, coming through, ravaging um, everything from the crops and so forth. You, have, um, you, you had darkness, which was the, the, the ninth one there, um, and, and so forth. But it's the, the last two. Right, um, that I want to focus on before we transition into Exodus 12, or the last, the next to last, and then the last, which is really presented into Exodus 12 there. But when we talked about the ten plagues, these ten plagues were, were given out, um, and they were given as signs, wonders, and miracles twofold. One, um, to, to directly attack the sovereignty of the Egyptian uh, way of life, the Egyptian oppressors, Egyptian gods, right? The Egyptian pharaoh um, king uh, was considered to be a deity incarnate, to be a god incarnate, right? Uh, walking in the flesh. And so really directly, he was considered to be um, Ra, the most powerful god, the sun god. So while each of these plagues attacked uh, a particular god, um, and if you want to take a look at deeper study, you can go through um, again, chapter 7, leading up to 12. Um, or or just, just hit us up and we can give you a, a listing of, the, each, of the, each of the gods. But it was to show the sovereignty of our Lord, our God. Because remember, as they go in, as, as Moses and Aaron are sent by the Lord to go and to deliver the people. He goes in first, all right? Aaron and Mo, uh, Moses and Aaron go in first to the Jewish elders to talk about the things that, that they had received from the Lord, both verbally and seen the miracles, and, and the, the folks uh, bowed down, repented, um, and, and confessed their loyalty to the Lord, right? And so then God sends, Aaron, uh, sends Moses and Aaron to see Pharaoh. 
But he had already given them warning that they that Pharaoh would not believe. And Pharaoh's words were, were of to extent of who is this uh, Lord, who is this Yahweh that, that I should bow to him? Because remember the context. He saw himself as a god uh, and the preeminent god of the preeminent empire of the world at that time. And so these people, these Hebrews, uh, were, were on a massive building campaign. Uh, and so he just he refused in his carnal mind for his fleshly desires, having been beat down um, trying to conquest parts of Syria, he was not going to have another loss. So he subjugated him, right? Remember we talked about that in the beginning of, of Exodus, Exodus chapter 1. And so the people cried out, and here goes the Lord to deliver him. So, so we equated this to a prize fight, right? Um, but I told you that if you were in boxing, if you were in MMA, you'd be discouraged because I would tell you that it's a fixed fight because there is no other God like our God, right? He is sovereign over all things and deliverance only comes through Him. It doesn't come through any other things. And so we proved this, um, you know, when we, when we looked at Scripture in the New Testament, Acts 4 and 12 talks about there is no other name by which we are saved than, than Jesus Christ. Right? And so you reverse that into the Old Testament. Um, God comes in to show the Israelites, right, to, to honor his, pro uh, his promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? Um, and you can see that in Genesis 12, uh, the promises that were made to him, uh, made throughout the lineage. But to reaffirm his relationship with the descendants of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, and to ultimately free them, right? But in order to do this, they have to believe, right? And we'll get to that a little bit further on. They have to believe in him because he's never going to force them, um, but, but just like he's never going to force us. So he goes in, he gives them the signs, uh, and he builds that relationship with them. Well, likewise, he goes in and shows himself sovereign over the preeminent powers and, and goes and, 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 and one by one, all the contenders, he's knocking down uh, the superficial gods. So if you like, um, if you like things like um, professional wrestling and you know it's choreographed and it's fixed and you know there's expected in there, then you can appreciate this story because God uh, already was the winner. He was already the crown winner. We just go through the, through the spectacle so that the world at large and Israel specifically may know that their Lord, their God, our Lord, our God, is the only true God, right? And so, so he goes into there. Um, and what you can see at the end of, um, uh, of, of Exodus 4, uh, he, tells, he tells Moses and Aaron to go forth to Pharaoh and to tell Pharaoh, right? Um, let go, Israel is my firstborn son. Let him go, or I will take your firstborn son. Okay, so that's important as we get to the last plague. All right, so the the ninth plague, I, I told you all, was really the TKO, the technical knockout, because after the the, the other eight plagues, um, the folks were willing to tap out. They they were willing to tap out, but Pharaoh, with his carnal mind and his fleshly desires, as God had 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 foreseen, would not let them go. So. The, la the, the next to last, plague number nine, was directly against their most powerful god, Ra, the sun god, by putting uh, the whole of the area into darkness. The whole of the area minus the Israelites, right? Um, and again, deliverance only comes from the Lord, right? The light of salvation onto God's people. The light bearers that Jesus would talk about uh, subsequently many, many, many um, years down the road. But this light would shine over the Israelites, but not over the Egyptians. And so there's a lot of there's a lot of things there, but I want you to focus on the fact that it directly refuted the authority and the sovereignty of Ra, who was considered to be the most powerful god. So now they've seen the crops go uh, and get destroyed. They've been overrun by locusts. Their their cattle is destroyed. Right? There's boils. There's frogs. Water and so forth. All these things discrediting all of their they're, they're lesser gods, but their main heavyweight uh, is now being knocked down. And, you know, they're, they're doing a standing eight count for those that are in the boxing, right? Um, and, and, and so he's, he's wobbling, and he should have just given it up then, but he didn't. He said he would, but he didn't. And so um, God says, hey, this is going to be the last thing. 
prepare yourself. So as you get to the end of 10 uh, and into 11, he tells Moses and Aaron to tell the people to prepare themselves um, for, for the exodus, right? Um, and so this is where that trust, this is where that faith comes in because he shall deliver, right? And so the final blow, remember the statement I said, Israel is my firstborn son, right? Um, uh, release him, you know, set him free or I will take your firstborn. So the last plague, the tenth plague, is to kill the firstborn of the Egyptians. And, and, and so what we talked about here um, is symbolically, it wasn't just the physical, but it was the spiritual message that was being sent. Again, the, the Pharaoh king here, um, uh, the, the, the Pharaoh, you're talking about abundant or being a large house, right? And how in, in the culture of that time, and it still is today, you're considered rich and you're considered prosperous by the size of your family, and in particular, uh, sons. But your firstborn determined that you were going to still have a lineage and a legacy. Taking out that firstborn severed the ties and 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 truly cut off and neutered the power, um, which really, if he had been smart, he would have stayed down uh, with plague number nine. But he made it to plague number 10, and this effectively uh, cut him down. And so mentally now, the Egyptians are, are feeling some kind of way, if we can use modern day lexicon, right? They're, they're feeling some kind of way. They, they're feeling the knockout blow, right? So I'm going to take you to the word. We're going to come from Exodus chapter 12, 1 through 13, then we're going to break it down. And, and, and I'm hoping you're, you're, you're writing some of this down and, and, and digest it a little bit because it's going to be a lot. It's going to come fast and furious, but um, it's, it's meant to stimulate and provoke thought on some things of how God is showcasing what he's doing for his chosen people in terms of Israel. And then we're going to pivot and compare and contrast of how it's relevant to our church today. All right, so I'm going to come from the New King James Version, starting at the first verse. I'm in Exodus chapter 12, um, the first verse, and it, said, and it reads, Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, the, uh, saying this, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month every man shall take for himself a lamb, According to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. Verse 4. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons. According to each man's need, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish. Okay, I want you to keep that. If you got a, a, a pad and paper, a little sticky note, or, or anything, I want you to take down... Exodus 12 and 5. Exodus 12 and 5 reads again, Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Verse 6, Now you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. They shall take some of the, uh, take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts on the uh, on the lintel of the houses where they eat. All right. So I want you to to, to mark verse seven as well. So we're we're marking verses five, Exodus verse five and and and, and verse seven. We're talking about a lamb and we're talking about some blood, right? All right. So uh, verse eight. Then they shall eat the flesh on the night roasted in fire with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Verse 9, do not eat it raw, nor boiled at all with water, but roasted in fire, uh, its head with its legs, and its, um, and its entrails. entrails. Verse 10, you shall let none of it remain until morning, and what remains of it until morning you shall burn with fire. And thus you shall eat it with a belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. So you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. I want you to keep that in mind too. So, so three things so far that I want you to keep in mind. The lamb, an unblemished lamb, a male lamb, an unblemished male lamb, right? Verse, uh, verse 7, um, so verse 5, verse 7, um, you, and they shall take some of the blood, 
right, and put it on a two doorpost. The blood, right, from the unblemished lamb, the unblemished male lamb, the blood, right, and then in verse 11, it says, so, sh uh, so shall you eat in haste, but this part is where you, where you really need to focus. It is the Lord's Passover. Okay. Verse 12, For I will pass through the land of Egypt on the night, and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. All right, so verse 13 is the last one I don't want you to write down. All right, now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. All right, so verses 5, right? Uh, verses 7, uh, verses 11, and verse 13. I want you to keep that. Uh, in, in, the, in the back of your mind as we, as we break this thing down. I want you to focus... Uh, don't, don't lose those verses because I'm going to skip around. All right? um, but verses 12 and 13 in particular, um, where it talks about, For I will pass through the land of Egypt on the night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. All right. Hold that tight. Verse 13, Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And a plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. All right. So striking the firstborn, man and beast. Understand this. When we talked about the depravity of mankind resulting from the fall, coming out of Genesis 3, right? We talked about the first murder in G Genesis 4. And by the time we got to Genesis 5, the world was so depraved that the Lord was like, look, I, I got to reboot this thing. But he found, uh, he found Noah and said, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start this thing all over through this guy here, right? Um, but of note, one of the things that we talked about, this, the, the tragedy of the flood, right? And really the tragedy of the fall is, is that the sin of the one spread to the multitudes. Can we receive that? The sin of the one spread to the multitudes. It didn't just spread through the first Adam, throughout all of his lineage, right? In other words, through Adam, through his wife, and through all, all, all their descendants, right? We have that stain, um, and that's why the last Adam, our Lord Jesus Christ, is so important because, as Romans 5 tells us, that just as sin corrupted, I'm paraphrasing now, uh, all of creation through the one, we are redeemed, we are saved, and reconciled uh, by the one, by the, by the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, right? So, but what's important here is that when man sinned, right, all of creation dealt with uh, their indiscretion. So how do we notice? So when you start to go into the, into the flood period there, right, God had, had, um, had Noah go and take seven of all the clean animals and two of all the unclean animals, all right? Um, and Noah scooped up those animals uh, into the ark. He took his family into there. But the rest of creation uh, was wiped out, right? Uh, the rest of creation was wiped out. And so the, the penalty of sin is not just with you, right? The penalty of that is not just with you. When we look through that lens and we look at the indiscretions of Pharaoh, after God had sent his messengers in to, re to, to let his people go and refused to do that, now other folks are, sinning, are, 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 are suffering because of the sins of the one go in, right? The sins of the one uh, impacts all concern. And, and what's, what's interesting about this is, is it's not just the firstborn of the humans, right? Uh, uh, just of the Egyptians. It's of the the folks that, that were the, the fellow workers, the slaves, it was also of the animals as well. God went through um, and, 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 and blighted them out, right? And so a couple of key points here, right? Um, that, that he is, he's not only sovereign over all these things, but the aggression by which he will go forth to blot out the darkness to save his people, right? 
the, the efforts and the, the means by which he will do to bring back his people onto him knows no bounds, right? So a couple of key points here. God has, has authority over what? He has authority over all things. He has authority over all the gods and all the creation, right? And he shows this. So he directly attacks Pharaoh. Pharaoh is seen by his people as a God incarnate. So, so he is perceived to be the man, the God, with all the power. Well, that was debunked in Plague 9, right? Remember the TKO I talked about? And then, you know, he had the standing eight count and his eyes were all glossed over. And our referees should have called it off. But, but Pharaoh's trainer didn't throw in the towel, right? So he was punch drunk and he went back in for some more. So when he went back in for some more, God gave him the fatal blow, right? He gave him the fatal blow here, which ended up um, uh, causing a huge turmoil all throughout the land. Um, it, it caused him uh, to lose, not only, you know, if he was in this modern day, day age, you know, his street credit would have been gone. Because here it was supposed to be the big bad god of Egypt, but darkness came on to the sun god. Then here was supposed to be the big bad god of, of, of Egypt, but now his lineage is being cut off and the people, the people are losing out on their, um, on their children. And if you really want to take it back, Right, and when we come into Exodus one, um, the people are crying out because um, because the previous Pharaoh had felt so threatened by the the, the, the divine increase. There it is again, the divine increase, um, the divine increase on the population of the Hebrew people. Right, um, that he decided to get rid of the the, the children, the firstborns, and and to stop them, and in particular, the firstborn males. Um, and so now God comes full circle. But the first point I want to make there is God has authority over all gods, over all creation. And he makes this manifest first to Israel, right? So that they might believe, they might see the signs, wonders, and miracles. Did not force them, right? But he is showing them that, that these things that are holding them bondage and hostage are nothing compared to the glory of the Lord, right? And second, he goes in to show himself uh, to be who he says he is and that he'll do what he says he will do by discrediting um, the, these perceived gods um, and the perceived physical bondage. But I want you to, to hold, that on, hold on to that as well, right? So he comes against all the gods and all the creation there. Um, and so, 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 so take a look at that. The second point is, is we talk about the suitable sacrifice and the blood offering, all right? And I want you to think back to Genesis 4. Genesis 4, where uh, despite their fall, um, God blessed Adam and Eve with not one, but two, and ultimately uh, more, more than that, but for the purposes of this, uh, blessed them with Cain and Abel uh, right off the bat there. And so... Offerings were presented. One was suitable. One was not suitable, right? Um, one was a blood offering, right? One wasn't. And, and there's, there's a lot of symbology there and a lot of lessons learned there. Um, but God himself comes and counsels and says, hey, you know, if you do what is acceptable, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted, right? Um, but, but there was a requirement for a blood sacrifice and it was not given. But he talked about sin crouching at the door, but you need to be careful for if not, it will overtake you. And it and eventually overtook him and he killed his brother, right? Um, but here again, you will see, and this will be a theme uh, throughout the cover to cover of this Bible, right? A blood offering, but not just any blood offering, because if that was the case, then we'd just go out, you know, knock somebody over the head and as they're bleeding, we would take that. But uh, an acceptable and a suitable sacrifice uh, had to be made when we when we take a look at the uh, at the offering there we talked about a, a a lamb an unblemished lamb and we'll get into that here as we take this home to us as Christians right but an acceptable lamb this will become the tradition um, that God will require um, an unblemished right not some sort of sacrificial hence the word um, you know or superficial lamb but a sacrificial lamb. Um, that is unblemished, uh, given up as an offering 
and a sacrifice to the, to the Lord there. So keep that. A suitable sacrifice, unblemished, uh, and a blood offering there, right? So we go back to, um, to Exodus 12 and 5, right? That, 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 that without blemish, that unblemished uh, male, right? Um, put that in the back of your mind. So I'm, I'm giving you a whole bunch of notes. Hopefully you're writing. Um, not a test, but, but, but just go, uh, go with it. Uh, we already talked about comparing and contrasting this sacrifice to what, what Cain would give. Um, uh, that, that what Cain would give the sacrifice versus Abel, right? God demands our very best, and He demands that blood sacrifice uh, of the unblemished. All right, and then what we want to do is we want to compare and contrast Exodus 12 with the Last Supper. Now I talked about this uh, during first Sunday when, when we when we had communion, and for those that missed it, we talked about how um, it's it's very. Um, communion can be taken very trivial, but that's not the point that, that, that Jesus made to us, and it's certainly not the point that Paul uh, gives to the Corinthian church, right? It was a very, um, very, very, uh, very blessed occasion that, that is due all this respect, because remember, Jesus says, uh, as often as you do this, do this in memory of me, but what was the occasion other than him getting ready to be betrayed? Um, and his last supper, literally, um, with, with, with his disciples, they were celebrating the Passover, right? And so, um, in the Passover there, the symbology of the unblemished lamb, right? Um, and the exodus, the, the covering um, from the, 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 the penalty of the plague, right? The death of, 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 the, of the firstborns. And so... When we look at this, there was a covering of blood, right? And so when Jesus talks about the new blood covenant, um, there, there, are, there are some things there that are parallelisms that we'll get, um, get into here in a second. But when we celebrate uh, the Lord's Supper, just be mindful of the historical and the cultural context of that when we talk about that. The only suitable and acceptable unblemished lamb, that is our Lord Jesus Christ, right? The new blood covenant that through that marker allows us to be passed over by the final plague, which is death, right? The wages of sin is death, right? But, but belief in our Lord Jesus Christ, that shedding of that blood redeems us. That faith in, in, in our Lord Jesus Christ, the faith in that blood allows us to be justified, allows us um, to, to be made approved back onto God, right? Um, but ultimately the grace of God. So by grace through faith is how we are saved. And it all comes from that new blood covenant. Not from you, not from I, right? Uh, it's not by our own works because each of us, born of man, born of woman, has that seed of the first Adam, right? So in that blood is a genetic disorder, is a genetic disease called sin, right? And so nothing that we can do um, uh, can, can, can wash away from that. Um, because we, we're, we're sinful by nature. If any of us were able to be perfect 24-7 through the span of our life, then the Mosaic Law would have, would have been able to save us. But the Mosaic Law was never meant, as we'll study throughout, was never meant to save just to make us aware uh, of the consequences of sin. The blood of Christ it was the only acceptable and suitable, right? This is what we believe as Christians, was the only acceptable and suitable way to redeem creation, right? Back onto him. And in a belief upon this, right? We talk about, again, Acts 4 and 12. We talk about John uh, uh, chapter 3, 15 through 18, and, and Acts 16, 30 through 31, all talking about how we, how we are saved, Right? Um, and so we, we, we take a look at these things, all going back to this unblemished lamb. So if you really want to take a look into the prophetic realm, right, when it says your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, we talked about that word eschatology, right? Eschatology or eschatological, meaning the end times, right? Um, so you can, you can pivot that and push it forward because when we talk about uh, the blood of Christ, right? Um, and we are delivered, we are saved, but yet this is not the finality of things to come. So when we talk about the end times, right? 
the, 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 the perfected body that is yet to come, and we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit later, the perfected body that is yet to come will come when Jesus Christ uh, comes back, partially, you know, for, for um, he comes for the rapture prior to the tribulation, and then as his kingdom comes here on, upon earth, right? Um, so that blood allows us to go before uh, the Bema seat, right? And so we, we won't necessarily be judged for our sins, for our transgressions will have been forgiven and covered by that blood. That blood, just as we talked about, the blood on the doorpost, right? The blood of Christ will atone for that. We will, however, be judged by what we do for the advancement of Christ and so forth. But the, the, the judgment of sin is, is, is done with. It's confirmed with the sealing of the Holy Spirit. But if you pivot to the end times there, uh, the same unblemished lamb, the same unblemished uh, blood will allow us to have that Passover, that finality of death, right? And that's, in a nutshell, how you compare and contrast um, the plight of Israel and the plight of the church, right? Um, and there will come a time in which Israel is regathered together, the tribes will be regathered together, and going through the tribulation, those who persevere to the end um, and, and believe upon Jesus Christ for their salvation will also rejoice in that. And those who don't will perish, just like the rest of the world. Um, but here we see, we see the unblemished lamb, right? A, a unblemished male lamb, uh, whose blood, um, whose blood will be used as a covering um, for the Passover to avoid the death um, that, that, that God has bestowed upon. There is death that is bestowed. This is why we talk about the death was crouching at your door, right? Death is there. And, and, and I, I allude back to Genesis 4 where we talked about where God himself showed up and talked to, to Cain and, and, and said, hey, you know, if you do what is right, will it not be accepted? But be careful. Sin is crouching at your door. Sin is crouching at our door for the wages of sin is death, right? That's the output of the carnal mindset. That's the output of of the fleshly desires. There's a way that seems right to man, but in the end it leads to death, right? It leads to destruction. There is an eternal, there's a there's a physical death from sin, and there's an eternal death from sin, and this is important, right? And so, uh, when we talk these things, the, when we, we talk in particular here uh, with the Israelites, that blood is covering them. It's that faith, though, um, in doing what, uh, and if the faith in, in that blood, the faith that God uh, will deliver them um, that allows them to be saved by the hand of God, right? It's the disbelief from Pharaoh, right? There was a warning that was given. Uh, I, I don't know about you, but, but, but nine times, well, really ten times, um, was given onto Pharaoh, uh, and he would not heed it, right? So, again, you, you, you fast forward to the end times, um, in the second advent of Christ, right? People will say, hey, why, if God loves the world so much, why will he allow these people to perish? Because just as with here, with the Israelites, and in, in setting the people go, God is pulling his people from the bondage of this world, right? Progressively over time, right? But just like with Pharaoh, the ruler of this world, right? Satan and all his folks, they got to go, Right? Because, because they refuse that the things that have ensnared and entangled God's people refuse to let them go. And so at the end of the day, um, minus Satan, because he, 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 he's not going to be saved regardless, and, and the beast, and the man of lawlessness, and all this stuff. But the people of this world will have received the gospel. Right? Um, let me rephrase that. They will have had chance to bear witness to the gospel and the gospel of motion. Hint, hint, hint. That's just why it's important for us to do what Jesus has commissioned us to do. However, because their hearts have not received it, because they have not trusted and accepted Jesus Christ as Savior, they have, they have been given an opportunity to move from their sinful state, but they refuse to. And as a result of not doing that, then God has got to let them go um, from their depraved state from the reprobate mind, right? And so, that, and, and that's, that's found in the early parts of Romans, talking about a reprobate mind. He had to turn them over to that mindset. 
because they wouldn't believe and they will not believe and they choose not to believe, right? Um, and so God turns them over to that reprobate mind. All right. So, so what, what I've already alluded to a bunch of this. I, I jumped ahead of myself, but for the Christians, for the Christians, how is this applicable, right? How, how do we take this and enhance our Christian living here? Right, because you say, "Hey, I'm 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 bopping you over the head about um, you know about salvation. Salvation that many of us, if we are Christians, if we truly um, have have been born again, have are regenerated uh, and redeemed of Christ, then we have received our salvation." Okay, so so I, I hear you, but it's important for your message to go out into the world and not only to understand it, but to believe in it, to walk in it. And, 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 and to go and to exhort it because Jesus Christ is Lord, right? And, and other than him, there is no other path to salvation. That's important. But some of the same key points are here for Christians, right? God is sovereign over all. All right. So I got to go, I got to go into the word to prove that to you because um, he's put all things up underneath his feet, Right? This is important when we start looking upon this. So when we say he's sovereign over all, I love that word all, A-L-L, -L, right? Um, some of us when we were younger, they, they would talk about the detergent, A-L-L, -L, all. But the point that the detergent was trying to say is all, was aptly named, it would take away all the stains, right? Well, Jesus Christ will take away all the stains. Um, and because of his obedience and his sacrifice, right, God placed all things up underneath his feet. But I got I to gotta show you um, and I'm going to ask you to write down a couple of a couple of more scriptures here. Uh, Ephesians, uh, the first chapter, and I know I'm going to be going backwards here, but the first chapter, 22 verses 22 through 23, right? Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. Uh, I'll call them back out here in a second. Hebrews 2, 5 through 11. All right, so once again, Ephesians chapter 1, verses um, 22 through 23. 1 Corinthians, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Ephesians 1, verse 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 20, verses 27 through 28. And then Hebrews chapter 2. 5 through 11. All right. So when we talk about God is sovereign all, I alluded to it just a few seconds ago where he talked about he placed all things up beneath his feet. So the exact, the exact verse is Ephesians 1, 2, and 23. But there's actual several um, places in the New Testament, and we'll, we'll read over those. But if you just, just a quick read there. And Ephesians 1 is, is a powerful chapter. It talks about the glory of our salvation and the importance of that. Uh, but when we compare and contrast this with the deliverance of the Israelites, right? We talked about the sovereignty of God. He's going in twofold. He's going in to show the Israelites that He is their Lord, their God, and He is sovereign over whatever it is that they think is precluding them from getting back to Him, Right? Uh, and then he went in to show the world that is represented by Egypt that he's sovereign over all their things, their gods. And so if you overlay that with our modern society over the gods of our work, over the gods of our family, over the gods of a bully, over the gods of dot, 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 adultery, over, over, over uh, abuse, over drug addiction, alcohol addiction, whatever it is, he's sovereign over all those things. So when you go into Ephesians 1, uh, 22 through 23... Right? I'll read from the New English translation. It says, And God put all things under Christ's feet and gave him to what? To the church as head over all things. Now the church is his body and the fullest of him who fills all in all. So a couple of things there. When I say he's sovereign over all, right? He says, And God put all things under Christ's feet, right? And gave him to the church. Christ is the head of the church, and all things are up underneath his feet, right? Deliverance only comes from the Lord, right? Now the church is his body in the fullness of him who fills all in all. Okay, 
So Ephesians 1 and 7, all right, also coming from the New English Translation, and I'll read it from the New King James Version as well. God is sovereign over all, A-L-L, -L, all. In him we have redemption through his blood, right? The forgiveness of our offenses according to the riches of his grace. So, so this, is, this is duality here, right? The blood covers, right? So, so, so one, we're going to talk about he's sovereign, a sovereign over all, but I also want you to take with that dot, 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 um, the blood covers. So just as we saw that the unblemished lamb and the shedding of that lamb was this acceptable and suitable sacrifice as they put it onto the doorpost, right? Um, and it, the angels would pass over. Uh, in other words, death would not come to that Jewish household. They would not come to that Israelite uh, household at that time because they were covered by the blood. The blood covers, right? Okay, so you, pa you, you fast forward to those of us who are in Christ Jesus. We already talked about it. The only acceptable and suitable sacrifice, the only unblemished lamb, right? So when we, when we talk about Jesus Christ, there are so many things, and we don't necessarily have a lot of time tonight to go over it, but the virgin birth of Jesus Christ had to be. Because if he was born of natural circumstances, then he would have that seed of the first Adam. But as a result, because he was birthed of the Holy Spirit through the womb of a woman, right? Uh, he came in all physical matters of, of, of man, Yet he knew not sin because he did not have the seed of that first. All right, so follow me there. So the blood of the unblemished. Jesus is the only one who ever was, who ever is, and who ever will be. They can go to the cross to atone for our sins. Right. So the lamb that is physical here in Exodus 12, if you look towards the present and towards the future, that word eschatology, right? The end times, that same unblemished blood, unblemished lamb, the lamb of God, right, is the only one. Remember, Acts 4 and 12, there's no other name by which we are saved. So when we look at Ephesians 1 and 7, in the New King James Version, it says, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches, riches of his grace. All right, so I, I hope you're following me here. So just as God required a blood sacrifice, an unblemished sacrifice to liberate them, right? And those who did not believe, those who did not believe and could not receive the word to be saved there perished, right? So such as it is for us in Christ, right? All right, so deliverance... Uh, is his even through death. So he's sovereign over all, right? He's, he's sovereign over all, dot, 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 dot. The blood covers, right? And then deliverance is his uh, even over death, right? And so you see that there. The death was coming and was coming indiscriminately for, for the firstborn, for the firstborns uh, uh, of the, all the creation there within Egypt, be it the, the humans, and be it of their, their animals as well. Minus the proper sacrifice uh, and covering of the blood that God required there, right? But 1 Corinthians 15, uh, verses 27 through 28, it says, For he has put all things under, the, under his feet, right? Remember, I told you that this is found in, in, in multiple verses there, uh, multiple scriptural texts by Paul. He says, For he has put all things under his feet, but when he says, all things are put under him. It is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. Now, he's talking about God um, and then in reference to Jesus. Now, when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him that God may be all in all. Okay, so let me break that down in the, in the New English translation. It gives a, a, a little bit plainer view there. For he has put everything in subjection under his feet, right? But when it says everything has been put in subjection, it is clear that this does not include the one who put everything in subjection to him. So in other words, when we talk about Jesus Christ um, being God himself, did not 
you know, he, he, he lowered himself, right? He, he was subservient to God the Father. God the Son yielded to God the Father. And this is important for the end times, right? He says, uh, it is clear that this does not include the one who put everything in subjection to him. And when all things are subjected to him, remember the end times I talked about, that eschatological um, study that we talked about, right? Um, the rapture that will, will, will translate the church before the tribulation. Uh, the wrath of God will come on those who have not trusted in Jesus Christ for their salvation, right? Uh, then Jesus Christ will come back again, uh, and, and the kingdom of heaven will be here on earth. The millennial reign will start. And then when that thing is perfected, right? Um, the judgment seats will go, go before uh, and God will present uh, present this to the Father. And this is what it alludes to. And it says, And when all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will be subjected to the one who subjected everything to him so that God may be all in all. Okay. So he's sovereign over all, right? Deliverance is his even over death because that's when we'll get our perfected uh, we'll, we'll receive the perfected bodies there, right? All right. So he's sovereign over all, uh, and death is this final plague, right? Death is the final plague. And we see this there uh, of the firstborn uh, as the firstborn of humanity, firstborn of all the animals there. Um, but death, death uh, is is that last plague. And we've, we've kind of hit home there. But I, I'm going to read this, this, this scripture here. It's a little bit longer here. Um, and again, another reference. So we've seen it out of, uh, out of 1 Corinthians. We've seen it also out of uh, Ephesians. Uh, and here is the writer of Hebrews also coming, um, talking about the same thing that we talked about, right? The son made lower than the angels. For he, ha he has not put the world uh, to come, of which we speak, in subjection to angels. But one testified in a certain place saying, What a man, and this is, I'm sorry, Hebrews Chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you take care of him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, and set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. Verse 8. Uh, for, for in that he put all the subjection under him. He left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not yet see all things put under him. But we see Jesus, verse 9, but we see Jesus who has made, who was made a little lower than angels for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. God is sovereign over all. He's sovereign even over death. That as Jesus Christ bore our sins on a cross, took all the accusations, right? He was convicted, uh, he was tried, convicted, wrongly, uh, and was crucified, buried on a third day, he rose again. Fulfilling the scriptures that as he rose from the dead, right, he would be the firstborn of many resurrected sons. And we talked about this, that as just prior to, to the tribulation, uh, upon the trumpet sounding, the rapture of the church, right, that the church will be translated, uh, Jesus Christ will come midway. First, the dead in Christ, those who are dead, uh, who have believed in Christ, they will be raised and their uh, their perfected bodies will meet with their souls, right? Boom, now go forth. Then those that are still alive will go forth, the church that is being translated uh, during the rapture, right? And they will go back up into heaven with Jesus. And at the end of the seven years of the tribulations, Jesus Christ will come back down with his angels, with his church, um, and, and go and, and, and drop the elbow, right? The, 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 the Lord's elbow there. Um, and he'll restrain. Um, he'll get rid of uh, the, the, the man of lawlessness, the beast there. Um, he'll restrain uh, a Satan. Uh, and then it will begin the millennial reign, right? Uh, and so this is what he's talking about. That, that in him, with him, through him, by him is everlasting life. Right? He's sovereign over all things to include death. And death is a result of sin, which we did not know until our carnal mind said, right? This is why we keep going back to the beginning, uh, to Genesis. Until our carnal mind said, said, hey, it's good to be like God. We're going to go and take this. And because of that, we knew of good and bad, which God forbid. Um, and because of that, 
He would not allow us to take from the tree of everlasting life uh, that we might have an eternal life in sin. So this thing called death, right, uh, could go one of two ways. And I talked about this on Sunday uh, during, the summer, during the summer sermon. Dr. Hickson said that uh, you, you, can, you can be born once and have two deaths, right? Or you can die twice, and natural and eternal. But you, right, you can, you can, you can die, uh, uh, you can be born twice and die once, right? So Jesus talks about this in John 6, about being born again. And born again through him, right? The transfusion of the blood. But, but God is sovereign over all things, right? To include death. To include the penalty and the wages of sin at death. And this is what he shows uh, to, to Israel there, right? Um, he showed them the light, right? As the light shone over them in, in plague number nine. He showed them he's sovereign over death as he caused death into the camps all around him except for them. And then the Passover, the Passover because of his instructions, their faith and the belief in it. The faith, the same faith that they had, um, we have, but we have um, the faith in a greater, and in a greater eternal lamb, an unblemished lamb that atoned for all of our sins. All right, so uh, I know we're running out of time, but I, I want to just go over real quickly. Um, the conclusion here is Israel's deliverance is twofold. Uh, there's a physical and there's a spiritual deliverance there. I want you to keep that in the back of your mind. The physical is a release from the bondage, and that's what we focus on most of the times, right? But there's also a spiritual um, spiritual deliverance, and that spiritual deliverance is to God. In other words, they're spiritually delivered from their carnal uh, mindset and that fleshly desires. Remember, they're up under that same curse of sin that stemmed from the first Adam, right? Spiritually delivered to God, He is theirs, and they are, uh, 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 and and they are His, right? So spiritually delivered to God. So what, um, what do we learn from Israel? Uh, and what we learn from Israel is that uh, you cannot have the former, all right, the physical. This is why you hear me praying for our, our souls to be saved, right? Those that have not accepted Christ, right? Uh, and those of us who have accepted Christ to remain, to, to, to remain in that right standing, no separation from God, to remain in that, that right standing uh, while we're saved, though, but we, we don't want to be separated from that touch, that loving touch of God, all right? But what we learn is we can't have the physical release from that bondage until we accept the spiritual deliverance from the world. And we've talked about this ad nauseum about this, this COVID famine that has caused us inadvertently to separate and distance ourselves from the world. We can't go to some of these things. Um, so we should be drawn closer to God. This is what we need to learn from Israel. And as we will go forth from subsequent chapters in Exodus, uh, you'll learn this isn't always the case with Israel. Because once they're delivered, their carnal mindset comes back. But I'm compelling you today... That as we've talked about, the deliverance only comes from the Lord. And we talked about the blood offering of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now is the time to be spiritually delivered to the Lord. To offer ourselves, right, consistently back to Him. Repenting uh, of, of, of our sins and, and, and going forth and walking maturely in Christ. Learning in Christ. Exuding His light and His righteousness, Right? Because we can't have the former, which is the physical, the physical release without the latter, without the spiritual. In other words, without Jesus Christ, right, you cannot have that physical release, right? Because deliverance only comes from Him. Can you, can you follow me on that? Deliverance of your soul is eternal. The rest is temporal. So if you don't have one, you can't have the other. And so that's where we got to focus our efforts, our thoughts, and our prayers, right? By faith they believe, trust, and accept that God, and we're mm -hmm. delivered. Christians, by grace through faith, are saved. So it's the same process. When we look in Romans 5, and I'm, and I'm going to close out here, they're spiritually de delivered and reconciled. So if you want to look that up, it, it talks about in the first couple of verses there, we are justified by faith there. Um, then physical restoration, uh, and then a the perfected body that we talked about, um, when our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. But remember that deliverance only comes from our Heavenly Father. And in this instance, 
the incarnation of, of our Lord Jesus Christ, the shedding of his blood, the only unblemished lamb, suitable and acceptable uh, for us to receive, right? Um, so, and I just realized I'm not sharing the uh, Bible Gateway tab, so I apologize for that. Um, <laughs> but hopefully you got the references. If you did not get the references, let me know. Um, or, or just, uh, I believe you, Pastor, was putting those into the uh, to the scrolling text there. Um, but we're going to go ahead and we're going to close out on prayer. We're one minute over. But I, I just want you all to know, we, again, we're praying that souls might receive something that was heard tonight, right? Those that have not accepted Jesus Christ, that have not trusted Jesus Christ for salvation, right? And, and why do I keep saying this to, to, to uh, an esteemed crowd of, of Christians who are saved? Well, because I want you all to understand the importance and the sense of urgency um, of, of taking this, being restored, being filled back up, uh, by the Holy Spirit and His Word so that you might go back. So something we might hear uh, might lead you to an action or to a word that might cause somebody uh, to repent, uh, to change their mind about this man named Jesus and to accept Him, to believe in Him, to trust in Him. Um, you, you have that ability in you, that the miracle that is you. Um, and then we know that there are physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual needs throughout the body, right? And we know that we know that we know. We talked about that He's sovereign over all. So we declare and decree right now in the name of Jesus that God's hand, His grace, and His mercy, as we see proclaimed by Paul in, 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 in 2 Corinthians 12 and 9, uh, as our Lord Jesus Christ says, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And Paul goes on to, to boast not only in his Lord and the sovereignty of his Lord over all things, the same Lord that is able to save us from an eternal death, right? That deliverance, all right? Um, the same God of deliverance of our souls is the same God who would deliver us from our afflictions, right? So we believe in that tonight. So we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that still saves, that still delivers, that still restores. And we just glory your name for you are a gracious and benevolent God. You are one that is so merciful that we could not accurately account for all of your riches, Father God. But we will do our best to try to keep you on our, on our thoughts day and night. And as we rise early in the morning, we thank you, Father God, for getting us up and delivering us once again, Father God, and allowing us to be strengthened in your glory, that your blessings might flow through us, that we might go get to the captives. They might yet believe, Father God. We glory not only in our Lord Jesus Christ, but in a grace that allows us to abound in our infirmities. Wherever there are sick among us, Father God, let your grace touch them from the, uh, the crown of their head to the sole of their feet and all parts in between, Father God, from the inside out, Father God. Let your, oh, Father God, your heavenly works move in and through us, Father God, knowing that you have not forgotten about us, Father God. But if today we are here to suffer for your glory and follow God, let it be your will, follow God. Yes, now, let, 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 let the one, follow God, see the joy that we have operating for you, follow God, and repent, follow God, and come to you, follow God. Let us be an encouragement, follow God, as our beloved Apostle Paul, follow God, says that when I'm weak, then I am strong, for your spirit rests upon us, follow God. Enhance our walk tonight, follow God, for all weak and lowly creatures, humble, follow God, in your presence and in your sight knowing that, Father God, you are willing and able to heal all things and increase, Father God, increase our walk in you. Now, Father God, we glorify your holy name. In Jesus' name, amen. Go in peace, be blessed, and give some Jesus.